Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Open Source and Business. This is a series of conversations where we explore some of the some of the lesser known or, or, or uh, lesser explored aspects of the ways that open source brings value in the business world. <laughs> and today I'm joined by Jim Fruchterman. It's my great honor. Uh, hello, Jim. Hey, Dave. Delighted to be here. Uh, Jim um, started in the late 1980s, a startup called, um, uh, you're going to, uh, it, it was, what was its original name was? Arkenstone. Arkenstone. Yep. Uh, a startup called Arkenstone, which has become Benetech. And over the course of 30 years has run uh, this, this nonprofit, which is headquartered in the, in the heart of Silicon Valley. And recently split off, um, a, a, what would be the best phrase for it, a splinter group? A subsidiary. Yeah, sure. <laughs> a splinter group. That sounds kind of subversive. I like it. <laughs> Called Tech Matters uh, mm -hmm. to um, to kind of refocus some efforts on some 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 new priorities that he has. Um, so I'm really looking forward to talking to you about uh, about the history of Benetech and how you've made it work for 30 years. Um, my first question would be, you know, looking back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, why would you, as a tech entrepreneur, um, start a business for social good that's a nonprofit in the heart of Silicon Valley? Well, you know, I was doing the typical Silicon Valley entrepreneurial thing, you know, dropped out of my PhD program at Stanford and in the 80s started seven new for-profit tech companies and only five failed. Um, and so, uh, and, you know, and I didn't get to Silicon Valley thinking I was going to become an entrepreneur. That was not the plan. I was going to get my doctorate and become a scientist and do research and, and teach and stuff like that. But um, but once you get to a place like Palo Alto and Stanford, you know, you there's all this stuff going on. So what happened is um, I, I start my first successful company um, was an early machine learning AI company, as we call them today, uh, doing what you could do in the 80s, which was Omnifont character recognition was kind of the leading edge then. And in the very first meeting, um, we talked about how you could use that to help blind people read. but all the business applications were, you know, scanning tax forms or insurance forms or um, contracts for lawyers. And, and so we went out and we raised $25 million of venture capital, not all at once. <laughs> uh, and, and that was more than we originally pl pl planned to need. Um, and we built, we built the product. Um, and that product is, uh, is now part of Nuance, right? So all these years later, there's still, still, you know, that technology still exists as a product. Though I'm sure it's been improved considerably in the ensuing time period, um, but uh, and and the moment of truth for me was um, I was for reasons I cannot explain as an engineer I was the VP of marketing of this company like by default and so um, and I we had done a secret project to make a reading machine for the blind and we demonstrated it to our venture capital board and it you know scanned the page it read it aloud in a terrible voice you know first generation Botrax synthesizer and. The board said, Jim, great, uh, the demo worked. How big is the market for reading machines? And we said, well, we think Ray Kurzweil's unit at, at Xerox is selling about $1 million a year. They're like, are you <laughs> out of your mind? <laughs> we put $25 million in this company. How is a million dollar market going to help us make the, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars that we kind of expected, given that we've been risking all this money. And I said, oh, it'll be great PR and the point, the engineers love it. And my marketing team loves it. And they went, no, and they beat it for excellent business reasons. I mean, it did not make sense for a venture back startup that wasn't profitable to do this. And so, but I wanted to do it anyway. And within a year I quit. And they went, oh my God, the founder's gonna compete against this. And I'm like, make you a deal. I won't hire anyone for a year <laughs> and, uh, and give me the right to sell your product into this market you didn't care about with a 75% discount off of your hardware product. So I, I was able to sell it to blind people for less than list and give my dealers some money and us some money. And, uh, and the one thing I was wrong about, um, we were three years later, we were $5 million a year at break even. And uh, I've never been associated with a startup that ever beat plan, but it was only because our expectations were set so low. <laughs> um, so was there any particular um, ideological reason why uh, reading books for the blind or a reading machine for the blind was the you first know, project that uh, Benetech took you know, on? It was, um, you know, it's atypical for the field. I mean, if you go into the disability tech field, half the entrepreneurs are people with disabilities, right? So, and the, and the, 
almost all the rest have a personal connection to a person with disability. Their kid, their parent, their best friend, their you know, their sister, right. or whatever it is. So, um, but no, I, I mean, this is this is what makes Benetech and me so weird. We're nerds. We want to do good, and you like you bring us a juicy problem, and we get excited about it. We'll find ourselves in the environment, or poverty, or you know, global health. Or, I mean, you know, we'll talk about anything um, right. because, and guess what? You won't be surprised. You know, they all need SaaS platforms, <laughs> and and because they're not dentists, there are ten companies already going after them because they're all in the charity sector doing social good. They're working on the world's most important problems, but who would start a company to do that? <laughs> really well, crazy. I mean, it, I've I just last week spoke, uh, or two weeks ago, spoke to uh, Laura Walker McDonald, who you may know, who uh, who started a, a a startup called um, uh, uh, um, oh crap, something lab, um, SimLab, excuse me, okay. uh, which was a a, a spinoff from Frontline SMS, yes. and. Okay. Uh, you know, she, she, Laura was telling me about the some of the competitive dynamics in the NGO space, and it seems to be pretty cutthroat. I mean, a lot of a lot of the, the, the their margins are very small. They try and spend as little as possible on non mission expenses, mm -hmm. and so you know, there's not a lot of money for technology. There's not a lot of money for um, uh, for investing in the creation of software that's custom designed for what they use. So it's a lot of off the shelf stuff, and it's a lot of proprietary software in the area. Isn't that mm -hmm. true? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, technology for nonprofits is completely dysfunctional. <laughs> um, and in a lot of ways, I joke, it's, a, it's like having a time machine, right? The way we build software, our attitudes towards open source are straight out of 20 years ago, right? And so, uh, and, and it's not easy, right? So, I mean, when someone comes to me with a great idea, and they could be a for-profit or non-profit, and, and and they could actually be a for-profit. There's actually margins and, and a good enough market with their product market fit. I say be a for-profit. It's a lot easier than being a non-profit. But, but the, the thing that, that I've been able to do, and partly it's because I've been doing it so long, is I, I tend to go after problems that are not near that border. They're a distance over. You would never start a for-profit to do these things, at least at the time they get started. Now, I've sold a couple to a for-profit. When after 10 years it became a viable business. I mean, I sold Arkenstone, that very re machine for the blind. I sold that for five million dollars to a for-profit like 10 years later. Um, and I spun off another one that was like a talking GPS for the blind at, at, for royalties. And I'm sure I got, you know, forty thousand dollars in royalties over 10 years. But yeah, because there's not a lot of money in the field, right? But um, and of course not me. My my charity got those royalties because I'm yeah. right. But um, but yeah, the field, the field is very tough to make it in. And Frontline SMS, which pioneered using, you know, texting technology for number, you know, shut down in the last year. And part of the reason they shut down is because they struggled so much to find money. And so, and and I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend this. But if you really care about social good and the market really is failing, and you you know, then starting a charity, doing it on you know as open a basis as you can. Is I think the future of this field, and and I can I can report that you know there are now several hundred nonprofit tech for good organizations tackling every kind of social problem you can imagine. So while right. I felt pretty alone for the first ten years at Arkenstone and Benetech, um, you know th this is a field where there's a lot of technologists who say, you know, would I take a pay cut to work on something that really makes my heart sing? Uh, and, you know, well. We don't have to change 99% of the tech industry, but if we can get 1% to work that way, right. we could change the world. <laughs> so let's talk about um, the first project I came across from Benetech was a project mm -hmm. called uh, Martis, um, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I think, Latin for witness. It was a software that created this cryptographically Great. secure system to record witness testimony in, in, in regimes where that would be you know, a dangerous thing to do to testify against the regime. And Martis had a hand in in several, um, you know, a post regime change um, prosecutions in terms of uh, providing valuable evidence against, against for crimes against humanity in in, in previous regimes. Yeah. Um, so, like a project like that, I imagine again, there's not a lot of um, for profit companies who would look at that and say this is an interesting market for us, right? Yeah. Um, so. 
what kind of thought process went into starting that project? And how did you go about funding that project through the initial creation? And, and it was, okay. like, do you think about sustainability in terms of financial sustainability before you start working on something? Or is it just, this Every is important, time. we need to do it? Every time. But I mean, but let, let, this, is, this is one of the big points I want to make, and it will circle back to the money issue, right? Is the nonprofit field is full of projects. We go to a donor and we say, we need a two-year project to build a piece of technology. And then you build a custom piece of technology. And custom technology sucks, <laughs> by and large, right? Uh, you know, that's why, in general, industry doesn't do that anymore. We would rather rent a SaaS platform and tweak it a little bit than start over from scratch every time, right? But the nonprofit sector still does that. So if you really want to, like, lift an entire field, you know, thousands of nonprofits working in a similar area, you build a product. You build an enterprise. You make a 10-year to 20-year commitment to be there for that field to justify them spending time learning your technology and using it, right? Because that's exactly the same in business, right? But people don't tend to do that. But that's what I do. I start companies. They just happen to be charities. And in the, you picked the toughest area to make things happen, human rights. There is no market for human rights, right? It's all charity-based, right? And, and if you can find, make money off of disadvantaged people, it's probably slavery or something terrible. So you don't want to do that, right? right. So, um, so, so no business in its right mind would do it. So the way that you make a 10-year commitment to a field um, is imagine if you just take, and you know, now it's a very understood playbook, you know, the lean, agile, blah, blah, blah kind of stuff. But it's, it's there, you know, you go, you talk to the people about what do you really need? So in our case, um, I had read about the um, El Mazzotti massacre in El Salvador where an entire village of 500 people was wiped out. It was reported in the New York Times, US government and the Salvadorian government said it didn't happen. The reporter was fired. And then 10 years later, a story came out in the New Yorker saying, oh, uh, we went and we excavated and we found 500 bodies. It really happened. And that pissed me off, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, and, and I'm, a, I'm a nerd, I'm like, my God, how can you do this? So I go grab like my favorite guy and we walk around the Stanford dish and we're like, ah, can we do force fields for villages? Oh, uh, you know, uh, more energy than the sun or whatever, you know, get, you know, if we could invent it. So what do you come up with? What's the only asset of the human rights field other than the people, the activists? It's information about it. So if you could capture that information and make sure it didn't get lost, you could strike a blow for the truth, which might mean that the consequences of doing something horrific would come more rapidly to the people who are sponsoring it and more lives would be saved over time. So that's that's the theory. So so how do you raise the money for that? Well, first you need donors who are very risk-taking, the equivalent of angels and startup capital in the for-profit world. Okay. And guess what? In the nonprofit sector, there aren't very many of them because you know, because they because they're in charity to do social good. And the idea of me showing up saying, hey, why don't you bet? hundred thousand dollars that I can invent a new company in the human rights field. Uh, okay. Well, anyway, we, we did, we did find someone who, um, who was willing to place that bet. And we also had sold Arkenstone to a for-profit and we had some money ourselves. So we, so we basically got that and we got early money from open society foundations and the two uh, key people at eBay, Jeff Skoll and Piero Midyar. So okay. they, they placed an early bet on us and then once the technology got working, then I could go to more traditional foundations and say, you should pay for this. And then I could go to um, the UN or someone and say, hey, let's let's work on this project together. And so, you know, by the time that Martis was a fully operational product available to, and we were probably working in half of the major civil wars or aftermaths of civil wars around the world, was there's someone doing a Martis documentation project either while it was going on or collecting data from survivors and witnesses. Um, you know, it was probably a million dollar a year project. And and 20% of that came in revenue from our from like the UN or big agencies, and 80% came from donors and in the nonprofit sector, a million dollar a year break-even venture is a giant screaming success instead of the dismal failure it would be accounted for in Silicon Valley. So, so that, that idea of capital formation from risk-taking donors to people who start investing when it starts looking real to whatever your long-term revenue model is, I mean, we're thinking about that when we start it because we have to figure out five years from now when the donors get bored, who's paying for it? Okay. So that 80-20 split uh, revenue from people who are using Martis uh, uh, 
being 20% and 80% being donors. Yeah. Um, how, how tough is that to sustain? Because you talked about, you know, donors get bored, they want to see results in a re relatively short well, I mean, time frame. I mean, to be honest, uh, Benetech shut down its human rights uh, technology program this year after 15 plus years. Now, Martis was end of life three three years ago. Now, I mean, this is the thing about nonprofit tech. It's like, you know, we would normally end of life technology in the regular for-profit world or in the business world a lot sooner. But, you know, right. yeah. but, you know and is Signal a replacement for Martis? 70% replacement, but um, but Signal has, you know, has has cryptography experts who who can who can take can go toe to toe with state actors, and I wasn't able, to, I was eventually not able to raise enough money to keep Martis uh, proof against state attacks on a million dollar a year budget. Just it, and so yeah. so so the responsible thing, and also frankly, a twelve or thirteen year old code base needs to be put out of its misery, right? right. So, you know, so and, and so yeah. um. So, so that is, you know, it's it's not easy, but the human rights field is a tough field to do that in. But for example, you know, are there other big areas, technology for people with disabilities? Um, you know, it's a 10 million, Benetech has a $10 million a year plus business. Um, in the United States, it's break even and donors fund our expansion into India and other countries. So, so there's a lot more money in education, especially for kids who just like that, not a lot of money by business standards, but you know, we have an eight and a half million dollar year contract in the Department of Ed to get any kid with a disability who needs an accessible book in braille, audio, big, karaoke style for dyslexic kids. So we find we find that model. And in the case of Bookshare, our library for the blind, you know, 60 or 70% of the revenue comes from one contract from the Federal Department of Education and everything else fills in behind it. And we have to do that for every new project. Okay. So how much does, um, like in that early stage, you know, what do you need going to, Again, the March example going to you know organizations like uh, Reporters Without Borders or Amnesty, uh, people who would be in this area of doing like human rights. Um, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Evaluations of the situations in different places. Uh, you know what's uh, like? Do they have money to spend on this, or is it uh, more of a you're providing it as a service based on? Sometimes, sometimes they do. Um... It depends on the field. Um, I mean, in human rights, I mean, we we did a lot of work in partnership with the UN and with Amnesty and Human Rights Watch and the Lawyers Committee, which you know, turned into Human Rights First. I mean, so so there are these international trusted intermediaries, but but in that case, they were more important to be our kind of trusted referrals. So if you're a group of uh you know burmese human rights groups or from myanmar you know and someone you trust says hey these tech guys are for real and they're good and that's you know the the, the, the program officer at open society foundations or someone from amnesty or human rights watch uh we, that really helps so uh in other fields uh we do get money from the bigger partners i mean right now i'm working on a big climate change project and and you know i'm working with a lot of the big international ngos and in climate you know and, and conservation like Conservation International and Rainforest Alliance and groups like that. And, you know, I expect them to, I expect them to raise a third of the money to build the product and I'll raise the other two thirds. And then okay. when it's going and, you know, and they do a new project in a, in a region, you know, in, I don't know, in Borneo, um, I would like to think that 10% of the money is set aside for the technology part and the data part and the dashboards. And that'll be, that'll be revenue to me. That'll probably pay, it, ideally, what it costs to do that work, but doesn't pay for the core technology, which I'm using right. other donors to pay for. So I'm always juggling the, you know, where do you find the money? And often, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, we once took a $25,000 grant from the UN and it cost us $75,000 to do the work. <laughs> Okay. And then we went, next time, let's not even take the grant from the UN because it cost us $50,000 or something of that, a pain um, to, to just deal with them. So why don't we just give them the technology for free next time? It will save us money. Right. I imagine that trade-off comes up with some organizations more than others, right? Yeah, yeah it does. But, <laughs> but you know, if I get an $8 million contract from the Department of Ed, I can pay $300,000 worth of pain and agony every year. That's no problem. <laughs> Um, so another project that uh, Benetech funded that I came across is uh, the Human Rights Data Analysis Group, HRDAC. Yes. 
yeah. um, under Patrick Bell at the time, but Ball, yeah, Ball, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was one that got a lot of attention a few years ago, and I'm wondering, mm -hmm. uh, particularly around the period of 2015, when the when the Ferguson riots were happening, there was a HR Dag did an analysis of police killings in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do those things help Benetech uh, to kind of say, look, we did that or we funded that in the early stage? Uh, do, is that is that the kind of thing that you look out for, or an opportunity to kind of raise profile of something that you're studying that you're? Well, working on? I mean, I mean, let's. I mean, we when we start a project, we try to imagine successful exit options because there's always the failure exit option, right? And so, spinning it off an independent NGO selling this to a business if it becomes a viable business that is still committed to doing the social good. Um, some big tech company has built it in their platform and we don't need to exist anymore um, or Signal is doing this thing so it's good enough. I mean, so so we're always imagining those exit options. And part of the deal with Patrick and HR Dag was um, when they came to Benetech, the idea is that they would spin off in four or five years and they spun off in nine years. So you know, it took a while longer, but, but you know, when they spun off, they, you know, they are the big data people in human rights, and we were delighted when they went from international human rights, which is all they worked for us on when they were part of us, to add police violence. We we're delighted by that, and yes, we promote them, but, um, but no, I mean, I mean, we, we didn't go out of our way to try to claim credit because, you know, frankly, you know, that was Patrick and and Megan Price, the his co-founder, you know, two scientists that are, it, you know, they're doing the work, and frankly. A large part of the HR DAG brand is standing behind the the NGOs, the the civil society organizations, the human rights defenders. So so we're we're a lot more in the background um, as opposed to you know disintermediating people and trying to say look at us, look at us. So I mean, the fact that HR DAG got a lot of attention that was probably from their standpoint somewhat accidental because they would rather you know uh, right. add, uh, you know um, the ACLU uh, you know you know go out there and file some lawsuits or something so but it was uh yeah it was definitely one of those areas where um you know there's a confluence of you know political polarization and you know this use of data science in in a novel way uh to uh, uh to to kind of make some conclusions about uh, about the situation in 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 America which which maybe you know, we don't typically think of as being a country that has a lot of human rights issues in the in the zeitgeist, but but you know, clearly has some deep and fundamental issues societally. Well, and this and this is part of the the, the thing that's changed in the world, right? Is we used to make policy and make recommendations based on educated guesswork, and and frankly, you know, the the COVID recovery bill, the CARES Act. I mean, they did a lot of stupid stuff because like, let's help poor people, but let's only have the ones that have bank accounts and and, and file tax returns. Oops. I mean, we, I mean, sometimes we have the data, we ignore it, right? But we, we are now moving to a point where it's possible to know. Um, and obviously we have an industry that knows a lot of things that are, that they know that we wish they didn't know, but, but in, in policy making, in making the world a better place, in, in responding to climate, you know, or civil rights, there, there's a lot more data. I mean, the, right. the Syrian civil conflict is in some ways over documented compared to past conflicts because of the amount of video and out there. And so now we have the challenges of dealing with too much video, something that, that Benetech has worked on and is still working on though. They're, they're getting actually out of it. Um, but, you know, the fact that HR Dag was able to say with some degree of confidence that police were killing three times more people than every year than anyone thought. Um, and of course, that 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 finding has been nothing but confirmed by more and more and more data, even though, frankly, trying to force police forces to report on this and coroners to report on this is like you know, news of now. Surprise, they're still not doing that. But but we have more and more data and we have crowdsourced projects to actually say, hey, if you know someone who's shot by the police, let's add them to the list. Oh, my God, why is the list three times bigger than what the L.A. police department says it is? Right. Let's ask those questions. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about climate change. You yeah. said you're you're working on climate change. So this is just such a massive area. I, I imagine one of the difficult questions is, you know, where do we start? Do we start with forest protection and 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 kind of concentrating on, as you said, Indonesia and Borneo and and Brazil, or do you start with uh, kind of uh, carbon um, consumption and optimization, or do, you know? The, what, well, I mean, let's let's just take this. You know, this is this is the whole world 
dealing with problems that involve everything the world does, everything the world is. I mean, it's 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 a it's a big problem, and um, and so I would never recommend any one solution. So the question is, is like, what's our unique contribution to this? I mean, you know, I mean, here's a big industry. If I'm going to start a company. What's what's the niche that I'm going to occupy and own and grow and make a lot of money off of? Well, we're looking for the hey, there's there's this giant problem. Where is a problem where technology can be used? It could make a huge difference. Like any dollar you spend on the tech is going to punch fifty times, you know, that one dollar, right? We look you know, those leverage opportunities are out there. So what we and I've been looking in the climate space for probably ten years for what the opportunity has been, and and have failed up till now to find something I, I so I, I started something called City Options six or seven years ago, where it was like, uh, someone in the city types in their city name, oh my God, we can look up a whole bunch of information about the city, we asked them 10 questions, and we, out, we spit out, of the thousand things you could do about climate change, here are the top 10, here's, here's why they benefit the climate, here's how they're paid for, and I went around and I talked to, I don't know, 50 people, and everyone said, great idea, Jim, but my top three problems are, and, and and my idea wasn't in their top three problems. So okay. so we, so that one didn't go. But what happened three years ago is that the conservation movement showed up on my door and said, hey, Jim, we remember you did Marathi, which was kind of the main project management in the environmental field, which we did about 15 years ago. And which, by the way, you still can't kill. It's still, it's still being used, even though it should be put out of its misery. And we got out of it seven or eight years ago. But the miracle of open source is that it lives on because someone else took over as a maintainer using it and somebody's maintaining it and it's like okay yeah and, and so you know so someone's spending you know a few hundred thousand dollars a year maintaining the code base yay right and so it's still get that keeps on giving but they said hey we like what you did for Marathi for project management could you do it for basically regional management so instead of focusing on this one project focus on this district in borneo or uh, this area in the U.S. and 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 the idea is, it's focused on local leaders in a in a specific area that and they they call it landscapes. Uh, but what they mean by landscapes is landscapes are more than ecosystems. Ecosystems are you know the national park. Um, a landscape is the national park plus the forests around the national park plus the farms plus the big city plus the tourism plus the you know, so it's basically a a real place and the classic example in the United States of a landscape level intervention is uh, Keep Tahoe Blue, which has been going for 30 years. And there are 200 projects in Nevada and California that are all focused on keeping the lake clear and, and beautiful. And that involves, you know, changing how farmers fertilize and how forests get cut, cut down and what the tourism industry does. And, you know, so, so it's a, it's a comprehensive plan. So we, Standard Silicon Valley, you know, playbook. We went out. And we talked to 25 of these leadership teams around the world. We found out that data colonialism is alive and well. So, you know, they make the decisions about the place, but they haven't got the data right. And it's especially prevalent outside the United States, where they don't have a robust government giving you weather data and mapping data and all the data. We, so we just take advantage of for free and can build companies on top of it. From quantum, right. it doesn't exist everywhere. So, so they don't have data. They don't have good maps, land use. Um, all stuff that we can do. Um, uh, they don't have great comms tools, and they don't have the money to do the smart things. So, um, so the idea of Terrasso, uh, this open source platform, where you know we're starting development like now. So we've raised the money. We just hired our our tech team. So we have about six people working on it. Is how do we make those local leaders, the big landowner, the head of the co-op, the indigenous persons council? the governor of the province, the mayor of the big city. How do we, if they get together and say, hey, we live in this place, and if we project forward 20 years, it sucks, right? We, palm oil will take over our planet, and you know, our kids will all leave the rural areas because they haven't got jobs, and and you know, water quality and soil quality is all gonna go, and we're, we're all gonna die, right? So we don't want that. So what could we do differently? Well, maybe we can have this more regenerative agriculture approach. And, oh my God, look. Uh, you know, some some investors want to invest in regenerative agriculture, and they'll pay us to keep soil in the ground or plant trees or whatever. So the idea is, how do we get those people the tools, the information, and the money to build this regenerative economies that they want to do? And in the climate space, for me, that was the gaping hole. 
people working okay. on the international level and treaties and people working at the national level. But the people on the ground who actually make the investment decisions and the employment decisions and the siting decisions and the local policy land use decisions, they had crap for tools. And if we could do something about that, well, we might be a top 10 software project that does something about climate change, which okay. is my secret ambition. So it's kind of like regional governments, um, uh, civic leaders in, in cities and, and regions, that th those are the people that you're targeting with this software? Yeah, and it, I mean, and you know, the needs of a, of a place in Montana is different than you know um, a rainforest district that's being taken over by by palm oil in Indonesia or the island of Fiji in, in the you know in the Pacific, uh, which is different than a depopulated rural area in Spain. I mean, it, but but if if you actually keep talking to all of them, it, it's like any product opportunity. You see, oh my God, they all want to do the land use. Oh my God, they all want to use pretty straightforward machine learning models to count the coconut trees in Fiji or analyze the you know. Where could we restore 300,000 hectares of degraded land, or what? You know, whatever the because I mean, this is people are working on climate change in a lot of different ways, but some of the low hanging fruit is you know stopping bad things happening at the local level around agriculture and forestry and, okay. and fisheries, and then doing smarter things. And if we can, and you know, and part of my my job is 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 bridging these groups. So I you know. I talked to a billionaire's private office who said, I want to invest in stuff that changes the planet and makes some money. And I go, oh, great. And I, and I talked to people on the ground saying, I need $800,000 to build this more ecologically sensitive processing plant. Well, guess what? Billionaires not going to invest $800,000 in that plant. But you know, maybe if we could help the creation of a $30 million regional fund in that Central American region that invests in those projects and those people get paid somehow, and we help them collect the data to show the billionaire that their you know, $5 million investment in that fund is actually leading to better carbon impact. Oh, and they made a little bit of money because it actually was a viable eco, you know, ecologically sensitive ag business. Woohoo! Okay. 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 Are, have you been talking to any of the state governments in the, on the West Coast uh, regarding, uh, I'm thinking of like forest fires being a, being a growing issue every year in, in the East Coast? In the well, West there's Coast. some terrific startups working in that area. And um, and I mean, I, I brought up Lake Tahoe, but if you go up and down um, the West Coast, uh, I mean, Lake Tahoe has open sourced their project management tool and it's being used in Puget Sound, right? And it's going to probably be used in other parts. So, so in a lot of ways, you know, nothing's new under the sun, right? A lot of my job is, is taking these great innovations. And, and of course, if they're open source, I mean, you know, uh, and, and, and that's what I'm, I'm, you know, we're finding, right, is we went out there. And, and the nonprofit sector, it's generally a broken system, right? So we went out there and said, hey, conservation organizations and local people, what are you using? And you know, they brought up 300 tools. Um, turned out that half those tools were like PDFs on how to run a workshop. I'm like, oh, okay, so you can't demo that tool. No, but I can send you the PDF. And I'm like, right. okay, I guess that might be called a tool, but I was thinking about a software tool, right? And then I looked at 100, our team looked at 150 software tools. I think 20 of them might be around in three years because they don't have that conception that you have to actually be around to actually make change. But of those 15, oh my God, there's some great open source projects in there. And I go to them and say, hey, you have the participatory mapping project. This is Mapeo done by Digital Democracy that is like, you know, mesh networking that actually seems to work. Oh my God, you know, and, 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 it, and the data is controlled by indigenous communities. And, and then they use it to like, sue mineral companies from polluting their their region. Yeah, I don't have to invent that. I'm going to hijack that and build that in. And so so a lot of our play with Terrasso is how do we glue together the, the viable open source projects? How do we make sub grants to them if we manage to find more money than they do and make it sing and dance, get the data under the control of the local community so rather than raping and pillaging them for their data. And uh, sorry, I shouldn't say it that way. Uh, pillaging them for their data um, and uh, or, or doing data colonialism, which term I heard a lot about. But we can do that. And just like in human rights, where we were protecting the data of the human rights groups, which they controlled and they decided what to do, we can do the same thing in climate change. And that will be the ticket of those local communities to begin to engage with you know the massive infrastructure that we have that is designed around the extractive data industry that is Silicon Valley today. Okay. okay. Um, what else are you working on in Tech Matters? So um, so we do three things. Um, 
Terrasso is our climate change effort, and it's our newest project, so it's just going to development. We have ASELO, A-S-E-L-O, which is um, a crisis response platform. So if you run a crisis response hotline for kids, uh, and there's like in 140 countries, they have a 911 for kids, um, and the National Child Abuse Helpline in the United States is the equivalent, uh, though it's an 800 number. Um, you know, uh, if you run a rape crisis line, um, an internet hotline where you're taking reports of horrible videos of kids being abused sexually online. So we're building the SAS Cloud Contact Center that none of them have that they all deserve. Um, open source, but open source on top of Twilio and Amazon and I mean, you know, like any modern, you know, and Okta. So we're actually paying some people to rent their cloud infrastructure, but man, we have a terrific project. Already live in four African countries. So South Africa, Zambia, Malawi, and Ethiopia. Uh, we'll launch in Brazil and um, and India by the end of the year, and I expect us to be in 15 countries by the end of next year, including probably the U.S. and Canada and some European countries. So, but it's you know it's open source, but um, which means that you know the data belongs to them. They could hire some other tech team to go operate the open source sort of infrastructure, the, the cloud infrastructure. But our job, of course, is to do such a fabulous job that they would never think about doing that. And since right. We're heavily subsidized by donors. And they're not paying the full cost, so it's economically more favorable for them. Uh, so, so that's our other big project. And obviously, you know, it'll be a five million dollar a year break-even venture operating the back office for fifty countries. And of course, every time we add a new feature, everybody gets it for free. Um, so, and and all we have to do is break even. So that so that's right. really exciting. And then the last piece I do is um, I, I'll call it my anti-consulting business. So because for 30 years, I've been the only tech guy in the room um, with a whole bunch of nonprofit leaders or philanthropic leaders, I'm the person in Silicon Valley, they feel like they can call and get an honest answer because I'm not in the pocket of AT&T or Comcast or even Google or Facebook. Um, and so, um, so I, and, and most of my job is talking to them out of bad ideas, you know. No, no one will download that app. Why do you think you need an app? What are you really trying to do? No, I don't care what your board member says, a blockchain, probably not the right thing for your first database project. I'm just guessing, you know? Uh, no, I know you want to build one giant database in the sky where you list everybody, but you know, we have this thing called a search engine and it, the information's already out there. So no one's going to go to your website unless you really do build the entire list and you have no way to maintain it. So what, what are you really trying to so, do? So I, I, I spend all this time doing anti-consulting and then if it's actually a good idea or a real need, I say, oh, here's someone who's doing something because I talked to all these different fields. So I, so I do a lot of matchmaking. And then what gets left over are the opportunities that turned into a Salo or Terrasso where someone has brought me a problem. I look around and go, who's doing this? Oh, nobody's doing this. Ooh, and it's a big opportunity. Oh, and it's probably going to be a nonprofit because no one can figure out how the money. That's a job for Tech Matters or Benetech or our 200 closest friends in the field where we really need 2,000 of those. So if you've got a great idea, let me help you on the path to solving another social problem that I don't have the bandwidth to solve. So you, you mentioned you're not in the pocket of companies, but I imagine there's some tension there with, uh, like if you've got a big donor uh, who has uh, something that they care about, um, surely that becomes something you care about, doesn't it? Well, this is the delicate line, right? Because, I mean, if you really want to solve a social problem, you want to be listening to the community and the, and the nonprofits that are working in the community, and you want to build the technology that they need. And then you talk to the donors and the donors have a different idea about what they want to fund. And so the art of my, of my main job is trying to bridge that gap. So if the donor comes to us with a million dollars or more, which has happened, and what they want, I don't think is going to succeed, but they're very insistent that they ha it has to be done the way that they, I just say no. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I feel okay about it because I don't want to waste their money and it doesn't do my reputation any good to start a big project that will use a lot of time, but won't lead to impact, right? So, so, but if, if, if I can like, get, the, the donor will give me 80% of the money is funding what we really want to do. And 20% is the hobby horse of the donor that isn't bad, but probably isn't something we would have done in the next year, but maybe we would have got to in year three. Do we accelerate it in order to get a million dollars from that donor? You bet we do, <laughs> you know? And, and so, um, and, and of course, 
it'll also be proven out by what, what gets used, right? Okay. So if the donor built on this extra feature and no one cared about it, but I mean, we're going to give it a go. And, and, you know, maybe we'll learn by implementing this feature that if we just pivot it slightly, then it becomes really useful. And, and okay. So, so that, that line goes on and, and I met, you know, I get, I get money from tech companies. Um, I get money from Facebook. I get money from Google. I get money from Microsoft and Cisco and, and, you know, and sometimes that's not very problematic money. Sometimes that's more problematic money. Right. And, you know, and, you know, why do I have a relationship with Facebook? Because I extensively publicly criticized them 10 years ago. And, you know, at, a, at an amnesty general meeting, you know, as who's the worst player? And, so, and they wanted to engage. And after 10 years, we found an area where, you know, where we could actually say, yes, we will take money from Facebook to work on child issues without, with, with a promise from Facebook that we don't have to give them any data back, which would, our, our partners would never allow us to do that. So, and, and Facebook was willing to give money on that basis, then we're willing to take it. And so that places us in a different place on the, on the spectrum, right? I need the amnesties or the Electronic Frontier Foundations out there raising hell in an uncompromised way. I'm a tech guy, I'm an engineer, I build things. I have to solve real problems today. And often, you know, we can move the tech companies to do a better job on accessibility for people with disabilities or be better on a human rights issue. Um, but yeah, I'm probably gonna be on the, I mean, because I've got these people to my left, generally, screaming, right. my pragmatic principled approach is likely to lead to something that's actually doable. And I'll be honest, the tech companies are actually giving more money now uh, than they ever have before. Um, and how much, of, how much of that do you feel is is because you know the public image of some of the bigger tech companies, the fangs of the world, is uh, is a bit tarnished right now, and Facebook in particular. And, mm -hmm. and how much of that is is about image management versus really believing in the missions that you're. You know, I mean, um, so so let me let me illustrate there. There, there's both kinds of giving, and I'll call it principled giving and the tactical giving, right? And and let's be honest, most CSR spending and public policy spending is tactical, right? It's it's designed to how is this going to enhance our business interests? But uh, I do want to identify, and I and I want to I want to lay this at the feet of of Piero Midyar and Jeff Skoll, who right before eBay was going public, were as far as I know the first tech company that ever gave pre-IPO stock to create a, a corporate foundation. And then Mark Benioff, and you can love and hate Salesforce, but he published a book, I'm going to say 15 years ago, that said everyone who's starting a tech company should pledge 111. 1% of your equity, 1% of your employee time, 1% of your product, um, ideally 1% of your profits. Um, and a whole bunch of people took the pledge 10 or 15 years ago. Companies that the average person has never heard of, but, you know, Box and Twilio and Okta and you know you know and you know they they all have been successful. So suddenly all those companies have you know a five or ten million dollar grant making program, and they like tech. And so and and and, and they're not kidding when they say they want to have one percent of their employee time and they want it to be not superficial, which is hard. But um, but we are I mean, there are so many things that we've gotten built in our open source projects because we were able to grab up four-person team at Twilio and said, can you solve this problem for us? We can't figure this out. How are we going to do Twitter direct messaging? It was a very, we gave them a problem and they figured it out in a week of service kind of project, hand this back a, a working prototype. And now Twitter DM works on our, on our crisis. And now when we want to do Instagram or line or any other social media platform, they paved the way. So and we, that happens a lot. So for us, we don't want them volunteering to, I don't know, install our, our, our local area network or, you know, help someone with their Microsoft Word installation. We want to get their expertise to tell us how can we actually solve this problem because we're generalists in almost every area, and we depend on you know the people at a Twilio or an Okta or WhatsApp to explain how we can actually make this thing work. But the but from their standpoint, you know, we know our our coders know how to code. Our product managers know the practice of product management, and so so when they spend an hour or two with us, we're going to go off and do really great things with it. It'll be a really good hour or two, as opposed to, oh my God, we're part of the nonprofit sector. We don't know anything and help. That's you know, tech companies try to protect their team from that, but okay. we can get in. 
um, because people really, their heart of hearts, would love to see their technology used to solve the climate or kids in crisis or fill in the blank social issue. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so you started in the late 80s. You've yeah. been through at least three depression or uh, recessions, right? 2001, mm -hmm. 2002, 2008, and just last year. Yeah. Um, and probably one in the 90s that I'm forgetting, like 91, 92. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that sounds familiar. So, so like how, how, um, you know, how do you, how do you manage? How do you survive? Uh, the, the, like how has Benetech managed to stay afloat through 30 years, you know, uh, five different presidential administrations and, you know, um, I would say a, a lot of luck, but, but it, it's kind of weird. Um, we're counter cyclical. Uh, depressions are one of the best times for a nonprofit tech company. Um, and, and, for, for a couple of reasons is the foundations tend to keep giving, not all of them, but tend to keep giving at the same rate during a depression because they have a 5% payout rule. And, and so, so they basically have to unload the money. And the best foundations um, say, oh, even though we, our, our total corpus went down, um, we can, uh, we, we'll keep giving at the same level. So, so, so the money is still there. And you know, and as we have gotten more government money, um, you know, through all those depressions, I mean, we've been in, we've had a major government contract from the Department of Ed, and it's politically popular with both parties, right? The average congressional district has a thousand kids using our service. Um, so, it, you know, so conservative Republicans and Democrats like it. So, so, you know, so, so when people say, let's defund all of X, oh, except for, except for this bookshare thing. We really like this bookshare thing. So, so we, we are able to survive these things and um and frankly it's easier to find talent during the depression when people are like i need a job you know, i'll take a 50 percent pay cut to work for a nonprofit right. for at least a couple of years or maybe they stay five years because it's so much fun and mm -hmm. you know so so it's but um but i think that part of the part of the other reason is i'll call it the portfolio effect right if this project ebbs and flows and this project ebbs and flows and they're out of phase with each other, you know, there have been times where we talk, you know, oh, we're out of money for human rights. Well, let's put them on Bookshare because Bookshare has more projects than, than staff right now. Oh, the tide swung the other way. Okay. So, uh, so, so we also, and, and that's unusual that Benetech has had this kind of ability to shift people and, and, and it extends, I mean, Tech Matters is still part of Benetech. Benetech, you know, shut down one project last year. And one of the people who was on that project, I went, she's great. Hey, why don't you come join our climate change initiative? And she did, right? So so I think that, you know, that we can manage to work this. It's a lot tougher in that infant mortality phase of you're in the first year or two. And the pandemic, right. I mean, if I was a 30-something person of color, woman of color, with a great idea that's just as great as any idea that Jim Brookerman has, I would have a lot harder time raising money than I do with 30 years of relationships and track record. And I, and I think it's something for those of us who are senior in any field to be mindful of how do we boost, you know, the young and diverse great leaders who should be succeeding, but don't have necessarily the ability to tap uh, the relationships at the tech companies for, for expertise or the relationships for money. And so I try to keep that in mind as I, keep cranking forward. Um, and it, there's no lack of great projects for me to be boostering. And frankly, donors love it when I bring them a great idea that is fit, fit for them and, uh, and and other people appreciate it too. So have you found yourself spending more time on, on kind of mentorship and, and uh, helping people along rather than taking on the projects and opportunities that come along in the last? Yeah, I'd, I'd say that I, I probably went from doing it two or 3% of the time to 10 or 15% of my time. Um, which, you know, and I, we call it, we also call it my karmic consulting business because I don't charge for it, right? Uh, and frankly, if I did charge for it, it would kind of like kill kill the vibe completely, you know? And, and, and frankly, I don't want to put more than two hours into any one of these projects unless it's really going to turn into something big. I can do a lot in two hours, right? Um, especially if it's around matchmaking and connections. So yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing three or four of these gigs a week, um, you know, uh, and it's from all sorts of different sectors and, right. and it's a lot of fun. I mean, you know, when you're a senior tech person with a lot of experience with, you know, 
eighty percent of what doesn't work and twenty percent of what did work, right? You you can you can share a lot of wisdom about. I don't know. You know, five people have tried that and they've all failed. So here's why each one of them failed. Don't don't feel for the same reason. Feel for a new reason. <laughs> At least <laughs> feel for a new reason, right? Uh, and that is like the that's like the highest and best use of that expertise, I think. Uh, and then every once in a while, that juicy project surfaces, and I go, ah, that's that's the next enterprise we're going to start. And right now, you know, my team is like at Tech Matters, which we're about 15 people right now. They're like, hey, Jeff, I know you have lots of ideas, but can we just get these two off the ground really going first before you add a third one in the mix? And I'm like, yeah, 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 next year. And then next year happens and then I delayed another year. So I don't, but at some point I want to do another one because okay. I'm a serial entrepreneur. That's what we do. <laughs> that, is awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. How, many How many people total does uh, Benetech, Benetech have, have, including Tech Matters now? Oh, probably pushing a hundred. Wow. Um, yeah. I all mean, local uh, or do you uh do you hire very remote well, well i mean the, you know, the pandemic has shifted things a lot right so before the pandemic i would say benetech and tech matters were 60 mm, percent bay area silicon valley and 40 percent you know global i mean we have a team in india and we have someone in east africa and someone in the philippines right you you need people on the ground and they they don't count as employees but they're considered full team members even though however we set that up um but in the pandemic i mean I, I don't know, I've hired, Tech Matters has hired 12 people in the last year. Uh, one of them was in the Bay Area, and that was the woman who joined us from Benetech, right? So from from Benetech Project. So I think that, I think Benetech is now shifting to where, you know, many of our team that was in the Bay Area, you know, they've moved to Seattle or Wisconsin or Sacramento, because frankly, if it's going to be a virtual world, spending the ungodly sums necessary to rent an apartment in Mountain View just simply doesn't make sense, especially for people with families, right? So, mm -hmm. so, um, so I think I, I and, I and I think we're like much of the tech industry. But you know, when when you don't pay market wages quite, because we're you know we're top ten percent nonprofit wages, but a little bit below average on tech wages. Um, flexibility about where you're located, flexibility in working hours, uh, flexibility that supports a family kind of situation. Um, those are all things that that make us an attractive option. And I think, you know, many tech people are choosing, you know, to prioritize some other things other than killing themselves and working in the hours a week and maybe then not making any money, which, as we right. know, right. is the mode. <laughs> well, maybe, well I'm, maybe I'm I'm I'm, I'm trying to think what, what I was going to say. Have you ever been tempted through the uh, through the last 20 years to move the headquarters of Benetech out of Silicon Valley for exactly that reason? Right. You're paying below average Silicon Valley wages, but that's still a pretty good wage if you're in. Like you said, in Salt Lake City or in uh, in yeah. In so um, in the mid '90s, we did a very serious consideration of moving to Portland or Seattle, um, and I think we surveyed our team, and I think we would have gotten like everybody on the team, which at that time was like ten. So it was you know it was a, a, when we were a much smaller organization, and you know and the cost of living in both those areas was probably half of what it was then in Silicon Valley, right, and the, the quality of life <laughs> was that at the time because at things time. evolved quite a bit in seattle at least yeah yeah at the time um but but in the end we kind of said well look you know the tech companies are here and uh, the money is here uh you know our fundraising is here um and while the you know while while making housing more affordable is where that we decided that the, that it was better to stay there so so we maintain the headquarters and and so what you end up is and this is you know an interesting structure is those people who are lucky enough to get a house in the area at some point in the last you know 20 or 30 years I, mean, I bought my house 35 years ago right so so you know i got in back when houses were two hundred thousand dollars right you know and so because of that i can afford to live here whereas if i was trying to do this now i couldn't afford to live here and i wouldn't i wouldn't start it here okay. so um so it's a it's a kind of trade-off but you know i think you know tech matters half our half our team is in the united states half the team is not and those team in the united states more than half of them are in other cheaper locations than this okay. area. And the people who are in this area are those who've been here for 20 plus years. So as we wrap up, I want to ask you um, one, about one last thing we talked about before we went on air. Mm -hmm. You said, if you look around, first, if you look around all the most impactful companies around the world, they're all going to be tech companies. Yeah. And you also said that uh, you're seeing a lot of people starting uh, kind of social good nonprofits Mm -hmm. Right now, in this area, in this uh, time, 
yeah. uh, you know, through through the pandemic and, and you know, the great resignation and, and so on. I wonder if you can talk about some of the areas where you're like most excited to see tech uh, for social good and maybe open source making changes in the next few years. Well, I mean, I think I think my my theory is that the nonprofit sector you know, I mean, if you look at who's won the Skull Award, the top award in social innovation, and you look under the hood, half of them are software data plays, you know, in the last few years. You know, Callisto, where I'm on the board, sexual violence survivors. It's a software company that's that's doing something really elegant around matching serial perpetrators and, and, and calling them out, right? So, you know, so Kiva, Kiva is a microcredit company, but it's really a software company. I mean, so so if you actually start thinking about it, the nonprofit sector, if you want to change the world for the better, they either have to become software companies or much more savvy about applying tech. So the, the, using technology for social good is a growth field, right? And you can make a living in it, even though you know, you're not gonna get stock options working for a nonprofit, right? But you can make a decent living for it. So it's actually, it's a realistic career choice. I would like to see, um, you know, like lawyers often move in and out of public interest law, right? As part of their career path, that, that the tech people move in and out of whether it's you know working for the for the government or working for a nonprofit, or if you have an entrepreneurial bent, starting something. So I'm very excited about that. I mean, I'm in the middle of writing a book about how do you run a nonprofit tech company, right? There's a thousand books on how to run a for-profit tech company. Well, what's different about running a nonprofit one? Well, a few things, and I want to, I want to share that because I want to see a thousand of them get started, right? Um, so I think it's it's a very exciting time. The world is in a lot of need. The world has become far more savvy, far more able to collect data. And there's just so much low hanging fruit to use that overused phrase. There's so many ways that we could apply technology to advance social interests and actively deprecate the evil <laughs> that we thought was accidentally being done. And maybe in some cases is no longer accidentally being done. We, we, can, we can have that choice. And right. I think that the talent in the tech industry has the power to shift the industry's behavior in a way that we've seen more of in the last couple of years. And I hope we continue to see even more of, because if we can move the mainstream tech industry, we, we can really change the world for the better. And it's it's been something of a theme uh, for this uh, series, this season. Uh, next week, I'll be talking to Benedita of Voting Works, which is a company that started after the 2016 election uh, to concentrate on fixing voting. And, uh, you know, his his company um, was involved in the 2020 election. Uh, so some of the recounts in the South ran through through their software. So I'm looking forward to talking to him next week. And I've, I've really seen a, a kind of, as you say, a kind of a groundswell of people who are, who are looking to, you know, to try and evaluate their impact on the world longer term. Um, yeah. And so and so I think uh, just to kind of really answer your question, every single area of social change that you can imagine has a, a SaaS platform play, a standards play, an open source infrastructure play, a data play. I mean, and 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 if you just like dial me to any one of those and we spent an hour talking about it, we will figure out where <laughs> yeah, where you could start a company. And so, uh, but I just 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 as we wrap up, right? Um, I just I think that you know the tech industry, the technologists have created these immensely powerful tools. They're being deployed to make money. And often with this aura of the only moral thing to do with technology is to make money. And I am deeply <laughs> against this idea that we should just say, oh, it doesn't make money, therefore we shouldn't do it. No, wait a second. We, you can start a viable two to $5 million a year social enterprise in the nonprofit sector that can change the world in that sector and make a living and change the lives of 10 million people. Those opportunities are all over the place. And I hope some of your listeners will get excited about doing that, or at the very least, making sure the technology they've created is available for someone who wants to do that. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, Jim. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I hope we will see each other more um, more frequently than, like, I think it's every 10 years is our... Is our... <laughs> I, I, I think we can do better. I, I really hope we're post-pandemic is a thing. Um, all right, Dave, thank you very much for, for the attention and spreading the word about using technology for social good.